أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين Akibat al mutakin salatu wa salamu rasulihi Muhammad. Imam Sahib, President, Sheikh, brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How many of you do know me? How many of you have seen me before? My name is Kamal Ishmael. I'm a long time member of this Jamaat. Um, when Brother Sattar reached out to me to come and give a little talk, I know it's always a pleasure to do that. I have been in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. I'm currently a nurse in the nurse practitioner field. I started as a scientist here working as a medical technologist in hematology at Mary Marklade Hospital before they closed. So all about pathology and disease, that's my field of study. Prior to me migrating here from Guyana, I used to work in chemistry. I started with the sugar industry where we used to analyze the sugar, fertilizer, and leave water, things like that. So I was based in the head office at Gaisuko, who took in Guyana at the time. So we used to do those analyses for molasses and the sugar to expo be exported. So after Mary Macaulay got closed, I moved from the field of technology, medical technology, into health and became a practitioner, nurse practitioner in that area. I mainly focus on mental health. But I worked in several areas prior to that. I work with people on events, breathing machine. I work with people on hematological diseases. And I work with geriatrics for a period of time too. So I know all about this senior setup. So that's a brief introduction of myself. So I'm very much surrounded in the healthcare industry. And I think I have a little knowledge. And I ask Altal to bestow me with more knowledge so that I will be able to provide that knowledge to whom I interact with. The only way this can be done is from your feedback. I'm here to moderate that knowledge, to facilitate that knowledge, but the only way that knowledge can be dispensed is from your feedback, from your interaction. I can stand here and deliver and deliver, but what use would that be if I don't know if you are receiving it? Let's first start here. What qualifies us as seniors? How you feel. How you feel. How you think. I didn't, I didn't discard the mom saying age yet. But age, as it says right now, is just a number. No. <laughs> age itself, practically, it's a number. 
So senior, in this country, they don't refer to them as senior, they refer to them as older adults. You have adults and older, older adults. But if you put the adults and the older adults in one category, then we classify them as senior. But we don't want to do that so we, because we would have to put a set of people here and a set of people here. And people would look, oh, this is the 65-year-old and this is the 80-year-old. We don't want that disparity. We are all brothers and sisters together. And we should identify with that in the same way. You know, this, it's a stigma also. This word senior or older adults is a stigma for the younger generation. They look at the older folks as though they're expired. Time is done for them. They're no good no more for society. Because when you say things in the home, they totally disregard you. You walk in society, people don't pay you no heed. They have no knowledge from where you came from, who you are, or what you are at this point. And this is a stigma throughout. So in as much as we, as we educate our seniors, we must also educate our youths, our youths how to, how to moderate themselves. And that has to begin at home. So I was asked to address you guys a little bit on health. And some of the issues that most of our seniors today are facing, especially people coming from foreign land, Guyana, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, etc. Many of us migrate to this country in our late 50s. So by the time you start to work and the environment has pushed you to that state, by the time you reach 65 and you're ready to retire, you have some type of a, a, an Ill, ailment. Something is going to bother you. If it's not the arthritis, it's diabetes or hypertension. And two of the main diseases today that is plaguing our seniors, seniors or the older population is diabetes and high blood pressure. And those are two diseases in itself that you, you can control. Genetically, scientifically, it has proven that some of us has a predisposition for diabetes. Based on your genetic makeup, if your family has a history, more than likely you will, at some point in your life, get that type of disease. But you can prolong it. It means that you have a genetic predisposition. But if you, know, if you learn at a certain level during the phases throughout life how to control your diet, how to do simple exercises, you can prolong that process from getting inflicted with diabetes. Diabetes is, is a very deadly disease today. There is no cure for it when you actually get it. There is only a control for it. But you cannot get it if you try to assimilate yourself to a proper diet and exercise, which is a very difficult thing to do today, given the fact that you come to this land and you have to work and you have to do things to make ends meet. Stress in itself is also a factor that causes many of the diseases in our system. Simple stress. It sends up a type of chemical in the body that causes the organs to overwork and thus lose its ability to function long term.
Hypertension is the same thing. Can be controlled by diet. But I'm here not actually to talk about the diseases today. I can do that at the other program. I'm here to tell you guys a little bit about advanced directives. How many of you know what advanced directives mean? What does that term mean to you? Brother Moaz touched a little bit on living will. Very important. There are three forms of advanced directives in New York State. An advanced directive is a document, a legal document, that you will have to dictate real estate, and health care for you. Two of the documents out of the three dictates your health. The third dictates your real estate. The one that Brother Moaz, Sheikh Moaz, spoke about, which is the living will, dictates your real estate. The other two, one is called healthcare proxy, and the other one is called a DNR. It does not only apply to senior citizens. It does not only apply to older adults or young adults. It applies from the time you reach the age of 18 in New York State. You can have a health care proxy or a DNR. That dictates your wishes. That di dictates what you want to happen to you in the case you are in a life-sustaining situation. Brother, Mo Brother Moaz, Sheikh Moaz said also, what classifies us to be incompetent? What classifies us to be dead, legally dead? Islamically, you are you are classified to be dead when you lose all cognitive abilities, when the brain ceases to function. Medically, it's when the heart ceases to function. Just understand that. You can be brain dead, but the heart still works. We can sustain your life in that way, but what type of life is that? So according to the jurisprudence, when your brain ceases to function means the brain is flatline. There's no brain activity in the side of Islam that is, what we call, that is actually dead. But medically, it's when the heart ceases to function. The heart has its own powerhouse. The heart works by itself. The calb works by itself. It has its own power. That's why your body can survive with the heart working alone, your brain dead. Then you're being put on a respirator. So these advanced directives would dictate how you want to live if these situations occur. Do you want to be put on a respirator? Do you want a feeding tube to artificially give you food to survive? Is that what you want? These are the things that the healthcare proxy dictates for you. 
And it's very important for you to have these things in place. Because like Sheikh Moa says, you have kids, you have other family members like to put in their two bits. And you have argument and you have so much distastefulness between family and family members. There are some family members you didn't see for ages and next thing you know they're coming and want to dictate everything. So to alleviate these type of fears, to alleviate these type of distasteful events, it is always best that you do that. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. How you want your life to end. The living will can have all of that, but there's a limit in the living will. It does not give the full coverage of the first two I spoke about, which is the health care proxy and the DNR. The DNR only tells you if you want to continue life on a breathing machine. The health care proxy has both the breathing machine, means that if if you reach a situation where they have to shock your heart back, you will see you don't want that. That's, that means do not resuscitate. So if you sign the check mark do DNR, it means you do not want to be revived if the heart stops. On that healthcare proxy, I have the form. I will share it out so everybody can get it to understand it. On that form also, it will stipulate whether you want an artificial feeding tube. They will put one through the nose to begin with as temporary. That is called a nasogastric tube. So that you will get supplement to live for a period of time. And then they will come to the family, whoever has the authority to dictate your health care to ask whether or not you want a permanent feeding tube. All right, this is what happens. Good question. If you don't have, let's first say that you don't have a living will, you don't have a healthcare proxy, or you don't have a DNR, and you end up in the hospital, and it so happened that you had, a, let's say you had a stroke, hypothetically, So which means the stroke affects the brain. The brain controls how we swallow. The brain also controls movement. The brain also controls how we breathe. So let's say for some reason you can breathe. You don't have no proxy, you don't have no DNR, you don't have no living will but you cannot swallow. So now you need a feeding tube. If you are not legally brain dead and you're able to make that decision, you will dictate your own proxy. If you're legally dead, meaning that your brain is dead, who will make that decision for you if you don't have a will or proxy. Anybody has any idea? All right, the hospital has what we call an ethics committee. The ethics committee will meet with the immediate family members who is the spouse and the children. The ethics committee also has legal advice. But one of them, from, let me go to the extreme now, one of the kids know that there's some money involved here. So he or she is going to put up a fight. Okay, if 
the, if there's some type of insurance and, and the mother or father is going to go and they're going to get it, that's where this party comes in. If there is a disparity in the ethics committee, they give you five days for the children to decide. If they can't decide, and it reaches an acute stage, two doctors will decide in the hospital. They have to get legal advice for that to happen. If it's a situation where it's a life and death situation and you are in the hospital facility in New York State and the children are being undecisive, they have the authority within 72 hours to make that decision. So that's why it's always best. Now that you know, discuss with family, discuss with your children how you want your life to be if these type of issues arise. Any other questions concerning that? Before we That's a whole topic by itself, but I'm just, I just break it down to that. Yes, Islamically, when you're brain dead, you're actually dead itself. You cannot make it, because you cannot make that... Yes, you, that form says yes if you want to remove yourself. If that happens and you, you know that your, your brain, well, actually you don't know because your brain dead, you can't make that decision. But you make the decision before, yes. So no kid can come and contest that. No family can come and contest that because that's your li that was made when you were alive on full cognition. And that is being sealed by a lawyer. A living will, a li just note this one, a living will must be signed by an attorney and kept in some place safe. All right. That brings me to the other point. There's something called a MOLS. And that's this form you're going to see when you go into the hospital. It's always pink. We call this, yeah, it's the pink sheet. But when you see this pink sheet coming to you with a doctor, people who knows about it knows there's no turning back. Anytime you see the doctors coming with this pink form, this is, the this is the original form. Pink slip. <laughs> so the moles, when you hear about the moles form, M-O-L-S-T, it means medical orders for life-sustaining events, life-sustaining treatment. And this is what dictates your end-of-life care. Most of the time, if somebody had a serious accident, a serious stroke, cancer, and you go to the hospital and they did all they can, and they realize that they have exhausted all medical measures and treatment in that facility, They would either discharge it to a nursing home or hospice. Hosp yeah. <laughs> hospice is the care they provide to you when they know you have at least three to six months to live. After three months and you're still alive, they come and they reevaluate you again because Medicare wouldn't pay for it after six months. They're saying if this person can live beyond six months, then the doctor's actuation wasn't correct. So they would either send you home or send you to a nursing home. 
But we know itself, man can determine man's death. Only Al-Tala can. But from medical science, doctors do know from results that you produce that these types of diseases that you're being inflicted with or damage, there's no turning back. When certain organs are damaged or certain pathway in the system has been taken over by a dreadful disease, they know there's no turning back. And cancer is one of the, the leading cause of these moles or a severe stroke. You had a brain aneurysm and 75%, 75 to 80% of the brain has been damaged. They bring one of these to you. So what they do, they bring this to the family member. If you have a health care proxy or a living will, they sit down with the health care proxy and explain to them. We may have to put your loved one on a feeding tube for a short period of time, or we provide nothing and put them in comfort, comfort care. We can survive without food two weeks and above, without food itself. But we cannot survive without fluid. Your body needs fluid to survive. 75% of your body is made up of fluid. Just like the earth, just like the, the, this world that al Dala made. 70% is water. And a third is land. Look how Alatal has made the world just in connection with human being. See, it creates the balance. When so much is born, so much has to die so as to make back the mass of the earth. So he has created that balance. Mankind today is destroying that balance. You see, they're taking the land from the land and building the sea so that water gets its place and come back on the land. Any questions about this? Any questions in general? So, so if um, you said the body needs to take this to some part, yeah. and, and can the medical person say no liquid, no food? Yes. They can say no liquid, no food, no antibiotics. They can say that, yes. Whoever has the authority on the proxy can say that. Let me see, Sister Jean wants. If you want the fluid alone, yes, you will dictate it on that form. Whatever you want, it's on the form. <laughs> original. No copy. Today with technology, we can alter anything. I can take that copy and put it in a scanner and make it look real. <coughs> so everything today is original. and think Most likely today, original is going from computer to computer. A lot of the hard copies are not working any longer. Give to each one, that's fine. that's fine. Yeah, but the original must be kept somewhere where all three of them knows. And most of the time, they put it in a safekeeping in the, in the bank, and some one of them have the keys. A lawyer, yes. The healthcare proxy can be notarized, a DNR can be notarized, but a living will must have an attorney. It involves more assets under New York State law. And this must be signed by a doctor. How long it's not signed by a doctor is not valid. 
Ja. This is done in the hospital. Yeah. This is only done in the hospital and nursing homes. Questions. I know you guys have interesting questions. There's a lot of questions surrounding this type of topic. Because coming back, there, there was another issue where coming back to the living will, the lady was reluctant to make in her living because she had a lot of land back home. And if you state that on a living will, and time comes around to declare when you want to go get Medicaid, and it becomes an issue, or you want to go apply for your SNAP, becomes an issue. So some people are smart. They go home, and they make a will for Guyana, and leave it here, and come here and make a will. Well, it's all the knows. <laughs> he knows how many assets on the sea brother Moaz says you have to divide the assets equally between children and one sixth with the parent. So how are you gonna do that? I know today, in this present situation, more than 80% of us Muslims do not do that. We favor one child more than the other one sometimes. Or the child that you end up with, that is taking care of you, sometimes you leave everything there. And many of the children today, I'm telling you, do not even consider the parent for that one sex. It's a very hard thing to say that you come here and you got to work. and This is how you start to think. And from the time you start to think that because you come here and you buy it, it wouldn't be your own house. You buy a house, and you, oh, I did this, and I did this, and it becomes you. So you feel, you f it, it feels you to come out and say, you know what? In this living will, because every night you go to sleep, and your wife going to say, you make this for that one, and you make this for that one, and she probably don't have a parent, so it, that's where dissatisfaction comes in. So it's a very difficult situation to think about it in that form. We all supposed to make it based on Islamic law. Because that's the correct thing to do. But society dictates us today. And it's very difficult for many of us because we hold on to our possessions, we don't know what happens tomorrow, especially living here. One other thing, mm -hmm. I think seniors especially, that making a will, they are thinking about they're going to die soon. <laughs> to make a will. You know, so they're afraid to make that. They're afraid to make this will. I agree with you, brother. I, I'm gonna I can address that at another, like that. another time. This is, very, this is very good at this beginning, uh, like Brother Salim says, for the senior citizens or for the older adults to come together and have this type of dis discussion. It is important for us to address all these things so that each of us can leave here with the understanding and with the confidence to know that we can do these things and not having a second mindset or a threshold to take that away from us. So, yes, I can address that. That's, that's, that's a way, it, it, how the, the, the psychology works. But you can, you can find peace within yourself by understanding what you're putting in and what's the outcome of it. But many of us have this fear, superstitious fear, um, the, the, the doubts we have in our mind. So we need to alleviate these things. And how can you do that? Through dialogue, through communication. That's the only way that we can do that. I see it's, it's getting close, and I, um, but I am is back in time, and I see. Yeah, um, I just want to add something quickly, that it might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one of our, the relatives could be dead, and when you 
1911, the poet of the world would be Mr. Shakya. So when one of the relatives passed away, and he came, he insisted, no. They say yes, that was a big argument. He said no, because the patient, they say yes. Then the senior guy told the guy his side. I said, leave these people alone. Because I think there's a lot of chaos with our Jewish cousins. Mm -hmm. That don't, you can't be for them. All right, it's good. Let me just finish up with this one. It's good that he brought that question. If there's no, if there's no document to support that, and there's two children, or two immediate family members, a spouse and a child, or two children, that is there to give that request that you don't want your child or loved one to be resuscitated, they have to adhere to that. Because you can always stand up in a court of law and say that this was the wishes of your mother prior to, or a child prior to them when they were alive. And that was stand up in court. So yeah, that's correct. They, they're not supposed to. It doesn't have to be in writing. Two people. It doesn't have to be in writing. It doesn't have to be in writing. They're not by law in New York State and in 48 states. By law, if you have that DNR there, they're supposed to adhere to it. They can be, they are liable and the lawsuit is so, is from $5 million and up. The lawsuit is very, very definite for them. So all EMTs are trained and all um, fire officers as well as police officers are trained to ask you first when they enter you from, from a 911 call, do you have a health care proxy, a living will, or a DNR? So that's a mistake, and that is a big lawsuit. I want to thank you guys for your patient hearing, and, and um, these are things that we need to, to address. It's, it's a concern for everyone, not only the senior citizens. And um, whatever I said is from the heart. Allah has guided me. And um, inshallah, we, we hope to continue this again some other time. Inshallah. <coughs> Thank you, Brother Kamil. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Asri in al Insan al Fi Khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر